Okay. Boker Tov, everyone. It's nice to have you all here. Thank you for joining us. Did we? Oh, I think we lost Eric Beezer. Boker Tov and good morning. We're going to get started in a second. We seem to have lost our men's club host, and so we're going to give him a second to come back in. But if not, we will get started. All right, well, we're gonna begin. Hi, everyone. Um, it is nice to have you all here. Uh, we are, excuse me, so sorry. One, one last second, we're, Eric's trying to get in. There he is. All right, Eric Beezer, would you please uh, do the honors of opening our program here? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to welcome everybody to our worldwide wrap uh, uh, seminar. And I'd like to thank uh, the people who have been working with me uh, in this uh, seminar. Uh, and. Uh, especially uh, Steve Dix and Norm Kurtz and Bob Watts from the Seaboard region, David Freeman from the Seaboard region and president of Sherry Tara, uh, and uh, Barry Oslick and Gary Brager and Michael Freyla, uh, and, um, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank um, a uh, special thanks to uh, Rabbi Ethan Wachowski. Without him, this program wouldn't be occurring. And to our guest speakers, Rabbi Jacob Blumenthal and Rabbi Ellen uh, Wallens Fields, uh, who um, are going to uh, speak to us uh, today. And we look forward to uh, hearing this program. So, without uh, any further, I'd like to send this back over to Ethan. Thank you. So I am going to, uh, hi everyone, I'm Rabbi Ethan Witkowski. I am one of the rabbis at Park Avenue Synagogue and uh, very, very excited to be here this morning with everyone. Um, I don't know where everyone else is, but for us it's a snowy morning and a wonderful one. Uh, so uh, when joining me today, so we have Rabbi uh, Ellen Wollens Fields. Let me add you to our spotlight here. Hi, Rabbi. It's nice to have you with us. Um, oh. <laughs> Rabbi Wollens Fields is a bit chilly in Dallas. Okay. All right. I, I, everyone, by the way, so we've got the chat is enabled. Let me do two. Sorry. Before we get to our panelists and our discussion, quick bit of Zoom talkless or whatever that, there's got to be a good word for that. So, um, the chat is enabled for everyone, although it could get distracting. The Q&A is also open. So if you want a, to ask a question of our panelists, why don't you either private chat me or do the Q&A function um, so that we can 
uh, keep the chat a little bit clear. But you know what? If you want to say Boker Tov, that's okay too. We're all friends here. Um, uh, so, uh, with the end, this is uh, being recorded. So there, it will be made available, I believe, later on YouTube for anyone who, for whom we speak too quickly, uh, or it's such a good conversation, you need to share it afterwards. So Rabbi Wollensfields, who is the executive director of the Women's League for Conservative Judaism, um, thank you for being here. And Rabbi Jacob Blumenthal, who is the CEO of the Rabbinical Assembly, that is the Rabbi's Union, as well as the CEO of the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism. Do you, does everyone who ever introduces you make that you're both labor and management joke? Um, is that <laughs> a lot? <laughs> yeah, sorry, that I, that I don't want to be trite. But so but I like gonna... but I like to say that for 20 years when I was a pulpit rabbi, I was both the rabbi and the cantor. So I'm able to keep both of those voices in my head too. Like during Musaf, I would be like, well, should we sing more or should we get to Kiddush? Like what's it gonna be this week? So I'm used to those voices in my head. Yeah, you do need to take over the Cantor's assembly to complete your trifecta of- uh... they, they have excellent leadership, I yes, would just they do. say. Um, okay, so before I get fired, let's, uh, <laughs> let's begin our discussion. We are here today to talk about tefillin. And I saw, we're not davening. The davening already happened. It was a lovely davening. Um, the rabbis we, and I were still wearing our tefillin uh, because it's a good visual aid. And because this is how it once was. Tefillin wasn't just a, you put it on in the morning and then you take it off. It was an all day affair that you wore your tefillin. One could wear one's tefillin. Uh, so we are, you know, just living the ancient life right now. Um, so to just start, uh, Rabbis, I'm so glad that you're here with us. And I would love it if we could begin with a simple, what does tefillin mean to you and what role has it played in your life? Um, we're going to start, Rabbi Blumenthal, why don't you begin on this? Um, first of all, it's just a great uh, wake up ritual. You know, um, we all look for those, uh, for that ability to, um, focus ourselves in the morning to bring God's presence or a sense of the divine into our lives, uh, whatever that means to each of us. And for me, um, I really look forward to that. So the idea that we have um, this very physical ritual um, that can create some sort of connection outside of ourselves, especially when we're half awake, uh, to me, I find that very meaningful on a daily basis. There's lots of other stuff we'll talk about in terms of how I make meaning of the particular ritual. But just the fact that we open the day with a prescribed set of, of rituals and not just words, but actually in action uh, is a great reminder for how we're gonna spend our day um, as it, leading a life of beats folk. I'll leave it at that for now. Boker Tov, good to be with everybody. I would say that one of the most important parts once I learned all about Tefillin, which I'll talk about later, are the verses that we say when we wrap the Tefillin around our fingers from Hosea that we betrothed God to us. It's as if I remember the first morning that I wrapped Phil in, it was October, 1993. I was walking to JTS and I was thinking, I feel like I'm marrying God right now because this is an obligation and a commitment that I'm making for my entire life. And that I'm connecting myself to God and all those people that came before me and those who came after me. And then in 2001, when I handed the ring to my husband under the chuppah, not only was the song Veras Tichli sung as I walked down by one of our colleagues, Rabbi Josh Heller, when I got walked down the aisle, but then the words that I said to my husband, Jonathan, was Veras Tichli, that I betrothed you to me. So it connects me both to God and, and that we connect ourselves to each other in the community as we wrap Philin. Thank you. I, I, uh, the only small thing I'll add to that is, um, as someone who did not grow up with Tefillin, uh, as a regular part of my life or even really knowing what it was um, when I first started to wear to fill in um, its profound weirdness uh, was something that actually really spoke to me. Um, it is, it is really bizarre. We're, you know, tying leather boxes to our arm and, and that's like something that we do. And um, it was something that really made me have to own my Jewish identity. If you're going to, you know, walk into a room and wrap these things to your face, then you've got to really want it. And, uh, and so it was something that really helped me take on what it meant to be uh, an, a, a more observant Jew. 
Um, so thank you. Uh, any, any early to fill in memories that you wanna share? So when I was about 16 or so, my, we were visiting my grandmother, my father's mother, and she found a pair at Tzvillin. And even at 16, I knew I wanted to be a rabbi. And my father put this fill in on me in front of my grandmother, who was like this old, you know, woman who never wore pants. She was very observant. And it was just incredible to just feel it on me. That was when I was 16. Fast forward to 1993, when I was wanted to uh, apply to rabbinical school at JTS. And one of the requirements was to wear tefillin. And this was not something that women in my community did growing up in Brooklyn. And I was a religion major at Barnard. And I decided that my BA thesis would be God, women, and tefillin. And I became, I started researching wearing tefillin. I did actually started wearing tefillin and I researched at the same time. And now I could say that all these years later, most people who know me know that tefillin is my complete passion. I um, hope this is an okay time to say. These earrings look like tefillin boxes. They say Esther. I saw them at a, a jewelry show that they were cufflinks and I asked them if they can make them into earrings instead. And then last year I invested in the tefillin Barbie. She's holding her Masechet of Yivamot. And it's just something that I've always loved learning about, not just my early memory, sorry, I took it to this. And then when I um, became the executive director of Women's League for Conservative Judaism, our sisterhoods across the conservative movement, I had the opportunity of teaching 40,000 women in Women's League about Tzvillin. So a couple of years ago, I just started my position in 2018. In 2019, we had Tzvillin 101. It was five weeks before the worldwide wrap. And each week I sent out an email. You can find them on our Women's League website. I sent out an email with seven facts each week. So after 35 facts about Tzvillin eventually, and ultimately about women in Tzvillin. And that led up to our convention of uh, eventually in 2020, which was a virtual convention, of course, where the weeks, months before we had a pre-convention discussions and webinar and uh, Zooms about women in Tzvillin, learning about Tzvillin, putting on Tzvillin. And then the morning of our convention, we had women have a Shechiano moment of putting on Tzvillin all together. So I can't say it, sorry, you were asking about the earliest memory, but I wanted to tell you about a continual memory that comes together because of my inspiration at 16 to do something that was rebellious. So. And I love that actually, Rabbi Wellensfields, because it's a reminder that yet, like some of our mitzvot, they happen once in our lives, or they may happen every once in a while, you know, on an annual cycle or something like that. And then there's tefillin, which um, I still remember when my father uh, introduced me to the mitzvah. Uh, he himself didn't put on it all the time, but he, it was very important to him to teach, to, to give me a pair of tefillin at my bar mitzvah and to make sure that I knew how to put them on. And um, I knew that he was actually, you know, in, um, in his parents and grandparents, um, you know, footsteps by doing that. So that was very powerful. But I often think a lot about all the other weird places that I've put on to fill in, uh, whether it's at the top of Masada during U.S. by Israel pilgrimage, or uh, when I was on Nativ, or, you know, when I'm in an airport, and I will move off to the side and put on my to fill in in the morning, or uh, when I'm on the airplane and I'm sitting in my seat and somebody's looking at me a little strange. Um, but they are just, you know, those different times are just, um, they, they, when I'm putting it on each morning, I often am thinking about some of those other times as well and sort of taking a tour back, you know, into some of those special moments. So, you know, I remember holding my, my kids while wearing my tefillin when they were really little um, or when they would come up and start tugging on the straps and the tzitzit. And uh, now they're bigger. They don't do that anymore. <laughs> but um, you know, but there, it is one of those meets vote that connect that can connect us to uh, a lot of really sweet memories, um, which uh, is one of the ways I think about God. Quite frankly, also, um, if we think about God as timeless and eternal, um, this is one of the ways in which you know we can create a sense of divinity out of the out of the mitzvah. So um, you know, it's a powerful experience. Wow. Thank you, that is very powerful. Um, and thank you to people who are putting the questions in. I'm seeing them and we're gonna get to these questions. The, the one about hairline is not one that I feel equipped to answer, but uh, 
but yes, to the original airline, not to your current one. Um, thank heaven for that. Uh, so I, I want to, um, Rabbi Wallens Fields, I want to ask you about women in tefillin. I think that's an incredibly important thing. And I, I will say, um, Rabbi Blumenthal, you can tell, maybe speak to this as well from your experience that for, for me at a synagogue that is very committed to egalitarianism, it is very, men and women are equal in every way ritually in our synagogue here. Um, women wearing tefillin is still something that I feel if there's one thing that, that women will sometimes say, no, 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 it's it's that, right? Um, and I, I, want, I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about, I know you are kind of the world expert on women and tefillin, um, one of, one of, that. okay, <laughs> one you. of, excuse me. Uh, but I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, the role of women in tefillin, both its history and in, and in your life and moving forward. Sure. So one of the earliest women that ever wore tefillin was in the, um, in the Gemara, in Eruvin 96a, it says, Michal bat Shaul, Michal, the daughter of Shaul, wore tefillin, and the rabbis didn't protest. So if the rabbis didn't protest about it, it must have been okay. And then through the generations, there were different discussions over whether or not they did protest, protest if they did, if they didn't, why? So Pasik the Rabati, Rabbeinu Tam discusses it, the Rashba. The Rashba in the 13th, 14th century said that they must have recited the blessing if she did it. And then there was discussion over why would they have not argued with or protested that Michal war? And they said that she was a completely righteous woman, a Sadekat Gemura, because she never had children. And it, some people say it's connected to if you have flatulence, if your stomach hurts, you're not supposed to wear tefillin, you have to have a guf naki. It's the, written about in the Gemara. So they said that because she never had children, she didn't have as much flatulence. So she was a sadeket and a righteous woman and she was able to wear tefillin. Who knows if any of that's true or not, how much they knew about the human body, but they did know about a lot of it. So some of those are from even later, the 16th century. Then we have um, a Kabbalist in the, just to give you a little, a short history lesson in this. In 1742, a book, uh, Or HaChayim, the Kabbalist Chaim Ibn Attar, it said that his wife wore tefillin and he didn't object. And he was so well respected. They said that if it was something that was bad or something that needed to be protested, he would have because he was such a, Rabbi, and he didn't object. There's no objection recorded that his wife wore. Later on in the 19th century, the maid of Ludimar, Hannah Rachel, who was the only daughter of Moshe Werbmacher, Ma Ma some, some name, also wore. And we go back to more recently, to say that 1932 is more recent, Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Toledano in his book, Yam HaGadol, wrote about the Kabbalist again, saying, if he didn't object, it must have not been so terrible that he would have, that Rabbi Chaim Ibn Attar would have objected if his wife was doing that. But it wasn't something that women commonly did. Rabbi David Golinkin has written a tshuva also about women in tefillin. That I think that unlike a talit that you can make your own, like Jacob and I have a very similar talit that we received the same day at our ordination, but it's not the same because his is his and mine is mine. He chose the blue stripes, I chose the white stripes. My daughter has so many different tali toad, I do too, that you can make it personalized. But tefillin's different. You can't personalize it necessarily, or not even necessarily. If you really want to be halachic, it has to be Torah Misenai that says in um, the Gemara and a minor tractate that the tefillin have to be black. They have to be made this way. They must be made from this materials. So you can't really personalize it. It's a real, it's a problem not only for someone who doesn't like wearing black or leather, especially. There are many people who don't want to wear it because it's leather, both men and women. It's uncomfortable at times. So it's not something, it's often, um, it's a visceral reaction. It just looks weird. It feels weird. So both men and women don't necessarily want to be wearing it. And then you think about our B'nai Mitzvah, the girls and the boys, we try to teach equally but they're at such an age that the tefillin don't come necessarily in a tiny size. So they get these big tefillin with these long straps that never stay on properly. They're uncomfortable. For my own son in 2019, I took my old set of tefillin where the roots out, the straps were all soft already. And it got, gave me the opportunity to get a new pair myself. And we checked the boxes. And this way he had a pair of tefillin that he was sensory 
issues that it was soft already. But think about all these different issues come together that people don't feel comfortable wearing it. And my next son, he has my father's tefillin that we're going to get inspected and then he's a lefty. So we have to retie the whole thing. But it really, it's, um, it's a visual, it's a visceral reaction to wearing it. It's very different. Some people think if they start, they have to continue doing it, which is a great thing. You really should. But if we think about it, for the boys that we teach at their B'nai Mitzvah, they often aren't reworn either afterwards. And sometimes the girls don't want to because they're like, well, I don't, I'm not going to continue doing this. And now with Women's League, with our women in that, in another generation, not our children, they're learning that, hey, this wasn't, this wasn't something open to me when I was younger, but now it is. So I'm going to try it. Some have taken their husbands and their late husbands and their father's tefillin and made it their own. And now women are passing it along to their daughters too. So I can tell you that I have uh, three children, thank God. And my oldest daughter, seven, who's 17, she started going to the worldwide rap with me the minute she could. And when she turned her bat mitzvah was at 12, at 11, I gave her, she's the only one of my three children that got her own pair of tefillin. It wasn't a hand-me-down of recreated. And it's become her passion too. She goes to USY conventions and she teaches the kids how to put on tefillin, her, her, her friends. At Ramah Rocky, she used to, God willing, this summer at Ramah Sports Academy, she'll do that. So I'm, I'm trying to not only teach my women at Women's League, but my own child that I have an influence on to teach the next generation to wear. She even, I don't know if at this point you wanted her to do it, but she created a, a wrap. She's a Hagalil Rel Ed, Cameron, and um, just to show, and, and she's one of, at least in my opinion, she's one of the cool kids. So if the cool kids can wear Twillin, then everyone hopefully will want to wear Twillin. So. I mean, you can't, you can't mention a wrap and then not have a wrap. Okay. Are we, are we gonna, <laughs> let's, Hello, <laughs> welcome. It's so nice to have you joining us as a panelist. How are you today? I'm doing good, I'm happy to be here, thank you. Excellent, we are very happy to have you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I, I imagine of the three, four now panelists, you're probably the busiest of all of us because I know the schedule of teenagers today. So <laughs> you wrote a rap about the about Tefillin? Yes, I performed it last year at our midwinter convention, which was really fun. It was in West Orange, New Jersey, I'm pretty sure. So <laughs> shout out to New Jersey. Uh, all right, if you if you would, if you don't mind, we would love to hear this rap. Okay, so here we go. Hi, my name is Cameron. I'm here to talk about Philip. It is important to me. I've been wearing them since the age of 13. Since it's the worldwide rap. I'm here to give this rap, break it down now. When I wear tefillin, it feels like I'm winning. This is because I have God wrapped around my arm. If I put tefillin on, it's like tradition carries on, especially because it's something I do with my mom. Tefillin makes me feel like the Jewish people and I are tight. So today on Super Bowl Sunday, you should try them on. What do you say? Well, well, thank you very much, everyone. That's our program for the for the morning. Uh, we're good. <laughs> wow! Mic drop. Yeah, drop the, don't drop the tefillin, but drop the mic. Yes. Well, well done. That was great. Uh, I, I and um, panels. Any questions about for for our panels about the rap? I love the line about your mom that was beautiful that that made me tear up a little and uh, and i was really interested to see if you were going to be able to rhyme anything with to fill in uh and and you got it that was very nice <laughs> <laughs> um thank you so much thank you so, um so you you're welcome to stay or go back to whatever apparently davening whatever else we were doing <laughs> um so uh but that actually is an amazing uh I think uh, bridge to my next question for, for everyone, um, which is about the next generation. So, I mean, other than Cameron, whose Jewish identity seems to be pretty secure, uh, uh, the, the question of tefillin and then and the next generation, there's actually been a few questions that have come in um, from our, our participants today already about this, um, whether it is, um, 
Well, I'm going to actually leave it open-ended right now. So I would really love to hear your thoughts on either what's going on with the next generation and tefillin um, and the future of tefillin as a ritual. Uh, and then we might go from there into a more a specific what you have done or could see doing um, in your capacities as rabbis to, to help you know, promote the future of tefillin. Um, Rabbi Blumenthal, will you start us off? Sure. I mean, first of all, I do think there is, there's a fascination I, I have found, um, you know, it's very interesting. A lot of folks in the next generation, sometimes in my generation too, they're fascinated by the idea of a tattoo. Um, the idea that something is really important to them, they should write it on their body. And of course, our tradition says that that's not the way it works, that we don't, uh, we, we don't need, that our bodies are uh, made perfect as perfect containers for our souls. And so we don't, we don't use tattoos as a way of marking them. But it's really interesting that we have this mitzvah of tefillin, which is meant to actually um, be very physical and to actually mark our body with a sense of God's presence. The trick is you do it every day. Um, and it's actually renewed every day, right? Those marks that we get on our arms from wrapping the tefillin tightly, you know, um, sometimes I can still feel the tefillin, you know, sort of wrapped on my head for a certain period of time afterwards, you know, that, that sort of shadow feeling you get. So, and then it dissipates over the course of the day and then it's renewed the next day. Um, but I think it's meant to do actually what tattoos sometimes do for people, to take something that's most important to them or their most important obligations or commitments and to, or ideas, and to imprint them on our bodies. So there might be some sort of opening, first of all, in terms of just talking about that. It, it's beautiful that, um, that uh, people in every generation want to do that. Maybe we, we didn't, we, you know, we wouldn't approve necessarily of doing it as a tattoo, although many of the myths about, you know, the tattooing are not, they're not so operative. So I just want to make that clear but um, for anybody who happens to have a tattoo, but the preferred way in Judaism would be to, to make ritual work. Um, the other thing that I love about um, tefillin is that it is one of those ways in which we make um, poetry physical, right? I mean, uh, so in other words, the, the rabbis had two choices when they had a verse like, you know, right? They had two, I, when, when we have a verse like that, that says you should, um, you, you should bind it on your arm and you should put it, you know, between your eyes. Um, they had two choices. They could have read it in a metaphorical poetic sense. They could have just said, okay, so we're going to, every day, we're going to take the God idea morning and night, and we're going to make sure that we see the world through God's eyes, and we act in the world with our hand, um, with our hands through um, through God's eyes, right? And actually, it relates back to the idea that we often talk about in Judaism and in religious life: head, hand, and heart. So we have head, hand, and then the this this box right points towards our hearts, and the idea that being we live both in the ways we think, feel, and act. All of those things come together. By the way, that's a modern metaphor. Um, uh, the ancients thought that thought was really based in your heart. So, but, right, but we, but they still would say we see the world, or in other words, we think, we feel the world, and we act in the world all through a lens of some sense of God's presence. And I think that that's something that we are always educating towards. Um, and this is a powerful ritual to be able to do that. And whether it's, as Rabbi uh, Wallace Field said, whether it's one time in your life that you put on tefillin, or whether it's an ongoing mitzvah, having that ability to um, see the world through this mitzvah, I think is really powerful. And actually, um, as a rabbi, I used worldwide rap every year as an opportunity to do that. I would bring parents and our kids in. I taught sixth grade on Sunday mornings for 20 years. Every year we would bring in our students and our parents and we would do an exercise together to explore this mitzvah. And, um, and, um, and I found it very powerful. And I have a, a whole like sort of like catalog. I forgot to pull them together, but I have a, a whole catalog of every year having like, you know, a group picture of us, um, of us putting on tefillin together. Um, and we would take group pictures and mail them, you know, and email them back out. And, you know, and it's, and it was very, I found it to be, I found it to be very powerful. And actually um, a lot of the students, I think, even if they didn't want to commit to doing it, you know, every day going forward, they found it absolutely fascinating. You could tell it was it was interesting. Um, it connected them to something which was non-rational. 
I don't like to say irrational, but non-rational, which is an important part of who we are. That's the poetry of life, um, is to do these kinds of weird, crazy things um, and to live out, um, you know, as the rabbis decided, to not just live life as a metaphor, but to actually create physical forms of poetry through ritual that we also have to reinterpret every day. Um, so I think there's a lot, there's obviously a lot more we can do. I mean, we have, uh, we have a lot of opportunities at our disposal to, to use technology to help teach about the mitzvah. Um, you know, we have ways of being able to connect like we're doing today. We're discovering that we can connect people, you know, all across the world through doing these kinds of mitzvot. Um, so I know, and I'm, I'm waiting for, you know, TikTok to fill in to take hold um, because I would imagine that there are great ways that we can, um, you know, bring this mitzvah into the 21st century, so. Well, can I add a little bit? Sure, but can you just tell Cameron to get the TikTok to fill in account up and running? Be I will, and it's funny that you say that because she does TikTok Torah. So as the So this is next. <laughs> someone someone wrote it on the chat that every sh every week for Hagalil she does Torah trivia thanks to Eliav Block over at Ramah Rockies used to have trivia at camp so she turns it into a question and then she acts out something from the Torah portion each week so I'm going to tell her that she needs to continue doing it with this um, that was one story that I wanted to tell you about the other one was when my friend Rabbi Blumenthal was saying about the tattoo. It brought back memories of years ago, I would go to Minion and then I would go to Curves in Lakewood, New Jersey. So Curves is a women's workout area and Lakewood is like, the woman would come in in skirts and shaitals and they'd come out in their pants and they're like without their shaitals. So I was like the only non Haredi there and I would be working out and I'd laugh to myself because I'm like, do these women know what I have like these marks on my arm? Because I'd come in like literally like five minutes after davening and I'm like, they might not see their men in their tefillin and I have these bizarre marks on my hands. It just cracked me up each time I worked out that I could exercise my spiritual and my physical. And I always wondered if these from ladies knew what I was doing in, in it all. Um, I don't know if you wanted to look at the chat. I know one of the questions was how women buy tefillin. So I have to say my first pair, my parents bought me at Hex, which is a very from store in Brooklyn on Coney Allen Avenue and Avenue J. And Rabbi Hecht, who's from the Hecht family of the Chabad, and others sold it to me. He knew what it was. He helped me size it and put it right. And there are many open-minded people out there. And if you allow me, can I tell you one more story? Is that okay? Okay, so when Cameron was having her bat mitzvah, she had the tefillin, she had the talit. All she needed was the bags to put it in. So we went to one store in Lakewood, because we lived right near there, which is a very from area, like there are thousands upon thousands of people at the Yeshiva Gadola. So we went a few times, the guy knew me after a while, but we wanted to decide what she wanted. So he finally, he said to us, when we finally decided, he said, I'm sorry, my Rebbe won't let me sell it to you. I said, are you kidding me? I've been coming here. I said, I don't need the tefillin, I don't need the talit, I, all I need is the bag. He wouldn't sell it to me. So I happen to know one of the head, I won't name him just in case he doesn't want me to tell people, but like the head rabbi in Lakewood, was, one of my congregants knew him. She got me in touch with him. I now have his phone number in my phone. I told him the story. He called the owner and said, that's not the Lakewood way. We don't make judgments on other people like that. It's not the Lakewood way. And the guy said, well, my rabbi in Muncie said I couldn't. He said, well, that's not how we do it. So what happened? This rabbi arranged for one of his assistants to go to a different store with me, with my congregant, Charlotte Krupnik of blessed memory. And Cameron picked out her talit and tefillin bag that has her name on it and has, we, we did a Mahari Ahuva Kiva Moed, her name's Ahuva. And the day I picked, and then they went out to lunch. And the day I came to pick up the, the bags, the guy held it up in front of people and said, look how beautiful this came out. So we might have our preconceived notions about certain people won't sell us, but they will. And I know that Women's League shares space with Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs when we're all in our spaces. And they do have a few sets of tefillin. I actually got them connected with this hex in Brooklyn to buy a few, but it isn't as hard. And I also wanna put out there that we have many sofrot, 
women sofers who will sell tefillin as well and make tefillin. And I know that one of my friends who's a rabbi in Fairlawn will be checking my son's tefillin. And someone, one of my Women's League women wrote, Barbara Ezring, whose husband, Murray Ezring, Rabbi Ezring, started the Worldwide Rap in Charlotte, wrote that the Judaica House in Teaneck will also. So there are ways to get tefillin for women also. Wow, thank you. Um, I, well, let me ask you a question and then I, uh, I have a thought about the, the next generation piece as well. But um, what, one of the questions, a couple have come in about this ethical issue um, of, of tefillin. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I think in the in the question, it was specifically about the, I, it looked like the environmental repercussions. I don't know if everyone can see my Jewish Climate Action Network sign behind me, right? That's that's a real concern or um, or, or ethical of, of vegan sort of requirements, et cetera. So my question for you, I mean, I, I know the halakha on this, but do you know in your, uh, you know, rabbi powers, are there, are there people working on this issue um, thinking about, are there ways that one could uh, sort of make more sustainable or ethically derived to fill in? Is that something anyone is uh, is cooking uh, up in their in their rabbinic cabinet? So I don't think it's on the law committees yet, um, but we are looking at alternative. Like it sounds weird, but alternative meats. So I don't know if we could look at alternative leather at some point. Like really lab-grown sure. leather. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's the only way I would think it, but then you'd have to have somebody prepare it. I don't know, some, some traditions you really have to look at to see the precedent. I don't know if there's precedent necessarily. The only precedent I could see is these all like alternative meats that like Rabbi Nevins has written to right. vote about. What do you think? Um, I don't think that we were, were actively working on it. No. I'm not sure what the workaround is. What I've often talked about with my students and congregants is that um, the animals themselves are not being slaughtered for the sake of their skin for tefillin. They're being slaughtered usually for meat. And in that sense, actually, we're making more use of the full animal by using it for this mitzvah, right? So, um, as you know, it would be good to have some way of knowing, for example, that it, that indeed the animal was not being slaughtered for the sake of the of the hide to be used for for this mitzvah. But the fact is, then we might use it because until we are all vegetarian, and the, I think the Torah actually does envision a world in which that's the case. But until that's the case, we will have animals that are slaughtered for the sake of their meat, and we can then use this to actually create meaning from it, even if we're not eating the meat. So um, right now, I don't think it's actually creating the market, in other words. Like the market is really being created for food and not for this mitzvah, and we can do it. But, uh, you know, I know that, but uh, symbolically, that may or may not really satisfy everybody's, uh, you know, everybody's ethical uh, concerns. Um, you know, it, I would say also, look, it's an ongoing issue in terms of the, you know, putting up a mezuzah, in, ter in terms of putting up, you know, using a Torah, all of those things require animal hides. Um, to be able to do the mitzvah uh, appropriately, and um, you know, again, I so I, I don't I don't know that we're actively exploring a way around that because I don't think it's the dominant issue that drives issues like climate change. Um, but I think it's important to be aware of it, quite frankly. And I, you know, and I think we do hold it. And if anything else, it it actually, um, you know. Uh, we're not just using it as a handbag or a fashion accessory. And the fact that you can't accessorize your tefillin, they come in one model, black, <laughs> you know, sort of uh, Henry Ford's, you know, <laughs> ideal. <laughs> um, I didn't you know, know that's it, what the T stood for in model T. There, there you go. Perfect. I love it. So, <laughs> right. It's our, it's our model T tefillin. So, um, you know, I think, uh, I think it's a, uh, you know, so I don't really, I don't know that there's a really great way around it. Uh, and it's very possible. Many people will see what I said as sort of ra as, as a rationalization rather than explanation or, um, but, um, and I'm not sure that we're going to be so quickly, uh, cre I think we're, the, 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 the lab set, the lab grown, um, you know, uh, animal products are mostly going to be around food, I think, rather right. than around uh, the hide. So I'm not sure if that's a solution. Plus, you think that tefillin are expensive now. See the way to see the price tag on the lab grown uh, tefillin. <laughs> but um, yes, thank you. Interesting. Right. Um, what one might do, by the way, is, you know, it would be interesting to um, 
to see if one could use the same animals that we, you know, there is an echo responsible way to, um, to eat, there, you know, a more ecologically responsive way to eat meat or environmentally responsible way to eat meat. Um, and we have a number of companies that are already engaged in that kind of work, right? You know, where the animals are, um, they're eating grass and it's, uh, and it's done in a way that preserves the environment, even enhances the environment. And um, it would be, but what we don't, I don't think is that to fill it, the, the meat is often sourced from those operations, but the hides themselves, you know, may not be, I don't know exactly what that looks like. It would be interesting to see whether those operations could actually produce hides that we could use for many of our meats vote. So that would be interesting to think about. So one could at least buy tefillin that were environmentally sourced right. uh, in a responsible way. That's interesting. Um, so I wanted to return, and, and we're gonna we're gonna veer towards the end in a section in a second. Uh, but the the questions keep coming in, which is great. So they can please keep asking, and we'll we'll turn to that in a second. I just wanted to add one of the things that I feel about the idea of to fill in as a mitzvah. One of the reasons why the Worldwide Wrap is such an incredible program. So thank you to FJMC and WLCJ for their sponsorship of the Worldwide Wrap. Um, is it doesn't take any ed education. I mean, it takes some education, but it's not, you don't need to speak Hebrew. You don't need to, uh, you know, have, have too much background knowledge. Um, you might need someone there to help you figure out which, you know, pattern you're wrapping around your hand, et cetera. But um, in that sense, it's something that really everyone can do. Uh, again, sort of questions of vegan or not aside. But, um, and so to that extent, I think it's, it's something that has an opportunity, right? It's time could be coming up where it's got an opportunity to be something that we, it's stock is on the rise, perhaps, um, uh, pun intended, um, about wearing to fill in because of the way that it makes us feel as we've been speaking, right? The visceral reaction, both good and bad, but, but especially the good and that it's accessible in many, many ways. Now, there was a question about inaccessibility of price. Um, which I don't know if I think uh, Rabbi Wallensfield used just mentioned that the, the men's club still has some pairs and I'm not sure I don't think that, I know they used to offer them but I don't think they do. I don't know how many they still have but they have some but one of the things also when I was a pulpit rabbi for 18 years it would often sadden me but people would often drop off their tefillin they're like we're going over our uncles or our father's homes and we're finding it and some of them are not hustle you can bring them to a sofer or a soferet and have them fixed and re, redo them a little bit so that the price could come down. A couple of years ago, I believe when Rabbi Dave Levy was head of USY, there was a call out to try to get pairs of tefillin for some of the USY trips and the pilgrimage trips, like uh, mm -hmm. pilgrimage and, and um, wheels. And I sent some tefillin sets over, but I really feel like if people look in their synagogues, there are probably some sets that can be re- used a little bit and checked to see if they're kosher, which I think would wow. also do the environmental help of, um, of recycling. Right, right. Which or you is can actually just talk to yeah. Beth Judea and Long Grove. They've got sets to spare here. So uh, everyone okay. give, so, and yeah, Oren, give them a call. The way, I want to do a shout out. Oren was the original rap that my daughter learned from because Oren Rotman, at, he was one of my congregants at, in Beth Judea. He does a fantastic fill and rap too. If you want to look nice. it up. I think we have it on the Women's League website. Sorry, Rabbi Blumenthal, I interrupted you. Apologize. No, that's okay. It's, this is a great conversation. And I would just say, first of all, it's interesting to think about recycled tefillin as another way of, uh, of, uh, of solving our ethical concerns. So that's really fascinating to think about. Uh, the second is people should talk to their rabbi. I mean, I would make sure anybody who wanted a pair of tefillin when I was a rabbi, when I was pulpit rabbi, I made sure that they had acts, you know, were able to, to get a pair. So, um, and, uh, and it might be worth it even for rabbis to think about how they could proactively start to talk about it. I will say I'm sh there are some families where this is a concern, I know. But uh, for, I would also just say that um, oftentimes it's a matter of value, like what are people valuing? What do they wanna spend uh, their, their money on? And um, you know, it, when a family is spending many thousands of dollars on a celebration for a bar bat mitzvah, I think they can probably spare the whatever it is, uh, 200 to $400 for a decent pair of tefillin for their child as well. 
um, or often I know that a parent or uh, that a grandparent or another relative is ready to sponsor that, you know, if asked. So it is a concern. And I know that we have families for whom it's a concern. I've had such families and I've helped them, uh, you know, in my role as a pulpit rabbi. And, and at the same time, I think we, one of the things we should be doing is really having our, uh, our folks think a lot about what's really of value and what could be, what could help make our uh, B'nai Mitzvah celebrations, you know, into something that's Jewishly meaningful. And this is, um, and this is a piece of it, you know, um, it's often very powerful. One of my dreams, you know how we give out kiddush cups and candlesticks for the B'nai Mitzvah? If we could afford to give each child a pair of tefillin. Right. And they have, and their, it's, it, right. I know it's a dream, but it's but it's that thing that we don't, right? I think that that's really important, Rabbi you know, Rabbi Wallen's fields that that we it's it you know we're we're willing to spend I won't say what our budget was as a congregation on a kiddush cup and a pair of candlesticks, which by the way we gave to every child, not like one for boys and one for yeah. girls. We give to both, right? But um, but you know like what would it what would it mean to actually make that kind of a budgetary commitment, um, you know, to actually giving a pair of tefillin. Um, that's a, it's, it's, it's very powerful just to think about, I'm not saying that my congregation did that, but it's an interesting, but these are all choices that we make both as families and as communities. And it's interesting to think that we don't actually make that choice, um, you know, in, in a way that we, we could, if we wanted to. Interesting. Yes. And, and also programmatically, you know, again, worldwide route, great example of this, but offering moments for people to wear to fill in, Again, you know, in, in our community, other other unless they're coming to daily minion, so really it's the daily minion before your bar bar mitzvah, and then maybe worldwide rab, and those are kind of the times where you're wearing it, um, unless you come to daily minion or someone goes to goes on USY or Camp Ramah or something like that, right? Or or any Jewish program where there. I didn't mean to just speak of those two, um, but uh, so. Yeah, it would be an interesting thing to think about if, you know, when we did, I mean, I, I can tell you right now, I doubt we would have much success on this if we were to do teen programs in the morning that would involve everyone wearing tefillin or something, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought of how to kind of make it just something that it feels like it, I almost feel like the reason why synagogues don't give out the tefillin is, is literally it feels like it's not the best in investment right? It's, it's very expensive and they're never going to wear it again, right? As opposed to the kiddush cup or the candlesticks, which you think, well, maybe they're actually going to use those at some point. Yep. So, mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is an, I think it's an important mitzvah, a uh, very important mitzvah. Um, and yes, to the, there was a question. Uh, yes. One that does, maybe I wouldn't say this, but um, hearken back to ancient, uh, amulets and uh, protective wards. That's where the Greek word phylacteries, which is the word we use in English, which, you know, phylacteries and tabernacle are in that world of the English word is actually more confusing and harder to say than the Hebrew. Um, but but, uh, but, but when you see those, like, but when you see those pictures of ancient felon, yeah. you know, that, that are, uh, that are unearthed and, uh, you know, I find that to be really powerful, just this, also this connection. And, and if they are amulets, well, am, you know, that's why I think these are, this is really the Jewish version of a tattoo, same idea, right? Um, it's meant to connect you somehow to the divine, to invoke blessing, uh, all of those things. The, 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 um, the um, men's clubs, uh, old video, I don't know if we still use it anymore, that talked about uh, the tefillin as a satellite dish, right? Which of course the next generation has no idea what you're talking about. But, <laughs> but that idea I think is really fascinating that there, has, there is a human need um, for some, for, for physical symbols that we wear on our bodies or that we have on our homes. Um, and this is what Judaism does. It takes those needs um, which are real and it creates rituals around them. It has adapted those uh, over time. And I, f I personally find all of our rituals that involve that process, I find to be particularly powerful, whether it's carrying a lulav, you know, shaking the lulav and etrog, which is an ancient, which is clearly based on some sort of ancient fertility rite, whether it's tefillin, whether it's putting the mezuzah on our door. Personally, I love that stuff. I think it's so fabulous to take these clearly, these things that have clearly very ancient roots in spiritual need and um, and make them Jewish. 
um, in really powerful ways and connect us to our conception of the divine in our lives. So. Um, Rabbi Wallens Fields, uh, uh, any last words from you as we as we say goodbye on this uh, snowy Sunday morn? I just, since I started learning about Tefillin, when I had to do it before to be accepted to rabbinical school, it, it was a had to, and then it became a complete passion for me. Learning about it, teaching about it. They're, gener they're people who I've taught how to put on Tefillin, who then went to rabbinical school. She called me her rabbi, now she's my rabbi, now we're dearest friends, that it's just something that you teach one another. And there's a, it creates a kesher, a connection between both yourself and God. And if you've ever taught somebody else how to do it as well. Like I remember the three people sitting in the JTS Women's League Seminary Synagogue that Francine Rostin and Karen Gluckster and Reese at that time and Andy Merrow, they all taught me how to put on tefillin. And it was just like an amazing experience and seeing my rabbis and colleagues around me watching me put it on. It's just an incredible feeling. And so many other mitzvot you just do, but this one, you literally, you feel it. And it's just a wonderful feeling. And also you don't have to do it you can do it with a minyan, but honestly, you can do it any time during the day and say the Shema. It doesn't take long. And it's just, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I love that men's club has the women, worldwide rep and that when I became the executive director of Women's League, I said that was one of my missions to get women to wear tefillin, that we can do it together now and really have everyone wearing tefillin and learning this ancient ritual. And it was really a pleasure to be on the panel with everybody this morning. So Tadar Rabah. Thank you. Well, so I'm gonna take the, I guess, I don't know, young guy, what, the kid's prerogative, whatever, current, only current pulpit rabbi prerogative to, uh, <laughs> to, yeah, you guys can run your institutions, but I'll just, I'm still with the sixth graders. Um, you're you're so, doing the important work. <laughs> right. No, but I just, I, I, to pick up on what both of you said, and as we say goodbye, and, and thank you both so much for giving us your time this morning. And Cameron, thank her for us, please, oh, for thank sharing. You. Um, that was pretty incredible. Uh, so um, I, the, I think Rabbi Blumenthal, you were saying this too, part of what I find so compelling about tefillin, as you were saying, along with lulav and mezuzah and these things that are so bizarre, as we said in the beginning, like it is in some ways, it's just a reminder that there's stuff in the world we don't know about. Like they, it connects us literally to the mystery of the world. It reminds us like, yeah, there's things beyond my ken. And, and the, my, one of my favorite gemaras about this is when um, the, the Torah tells us, right, that um, will tell us in a minute, I think, right, that um, God, Moses asks to see God, and God says, you can't see me, but you can see my back, right, and so, you know, walks, walks by, and the, and the, the rabbis in the Talmud, of course, ask, so new, what does God's back look like, what did Moshe see, exactly, and they say that what Moshe saw was the back of God's tefillin knot, which I think is so beautiful because it says that basically that the rabbis believe that as every morning when we're like, God, we love you so much. God is putting on God's tefillin and they say, well, what's in God's tefillin? Ah, it's all the verses about how much God loves us. And so there, it really brings home this idea that when I read that, I realized, oh, when I put on the tefillin, it's my just silent hope that there is something out there that also cares about me, right? I have no idea. I have no idea if the world cares about me at all. But when I put on my tefillin, I'm thinking, please, God, let there be a God. Let that God care about me. And we're going to bind ourselves together. We're in this together, God, you and I. And I think that that idea just really makes the tefillin uh, come alive for me. And uh, so hopefully, friends, Worldwide Wrap Day, we all wrapped our tefillin. If not, you know, go find some tefillin, go borrow some tefillin from Beth Jacob in Illinois, uh, wherever you can find them. And, uh, and don't do it just today, but do it again and again and again. So rabbis, thank you so much for being here. Um, to FJMC and WLCJ, thank you for organizing this. Thank you to everyone who put this together, everyone who led the led Minyanim that had already happened, uh, will lead Minyanim, et cetera, et cetera. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, a call to all. Bye.